About a week ago, a friend of mine and former intern in this church, Jessica Mercury, got her first tattoo. And I know because she posted on her Facebook. And she said after serious reflection, she decided to have on her forearm the words, nevertheless, she persisted, inked in her skin. For those of you who do not understand the reference, <clears throat> approximately a month ago, there was a debate in the U.S. Senate about cabinet nomination. Democrats were against some appointment, Republicans were in favor, and some would say there was nothing special here, just politics as usual. However, at one point, Senator Elizabeth Warren's speech was terminated against her will by the leaders of the Senate. And when asked why they use an arcane rule to stop her, to interrupt her, Senator Mitch McConnell said she was warned, she was given an explanation, nevertheless, she persisted. And these few words have stricken a very sensible chord with numerous women. Many can see themselves and their personal experience in these words because they have been shush, quiet, or told that they are too much this, not enough that, they're doing it wrong, they're disturbing the established rules. Many still remember to be instructed early in life that little girl needs to be seen, not heard. Many have been advised by a group of men to smile a little more and dress differently if they want to get something achieved. And when it did not work, these men usually come back and says, well, we told you, but you did not listen to us. You had to be stubborn and do it your way. Well, too bad for you. This is what happened when you don't want to be a good little girl. The expression, nevertheless, she persisted, has become for strong women everywhere a new mantra, a new slogan of resistance for those who are called nasty or loud for just being themselves. And we come to today's passage from the Gospel according to John with all this cultural and societal baggage. Ah, the story of the Samaritan women. It's a classic for churchgoers. We believe we know it so well that we barely pay attention to it anymore. Jesus and his disciples are on their way back to Galilee after a short trip in Judea. So they have to go through Samaria. And we know from the text that Jews did not share things in common with the Samaritans. It's a hot day. In the village of Sichar, Jesus decides to rest by the well. Uh, the disciples go for food. Then Jesus sees a woman and ask her to give him something to drink. And by doing so, he cross gender, ethnic, political, and religious borders. What a great story, we say. Maybe, maybe, it's, it's just that we have been told countless times that the gospel according to John is different from the other ones. The first three Gospels focus their attention on chronology and events of, in Jesus' life. The fourth Gospel is completely different. It's all about symbols, image, allegories, metaphors. Just last week, <coughs> we, meet, we met, last week we met Nicodemus, who thought that he actually had to go back inside his mother to be born again. 
And by this story, we are led to understand that we need to look beyond a literal interpretation of scripture. However, only one chapter later, when it comes to the story of the Samaritan women, we seem to forget all of this and revert to, revert to read the gospel at the first level. Let's see, it's about noon. A Samaritan woman comes to draw water uh, at Jacob's well, and we say, ha ha, this woman should not be there in the middle of the day, because back then, water was usually drawn during cooler time, like morning and evenings. So they must mean, this must mean there's something wrong with this woman. She must be an outcast from her village. She must have a shady past. She must have been shunned. Even if, like I just said before, the Gospel of John is highly symbolic. It is the one in which Jesus says, I am the light of the world. And previously, Nicodemus come to visit Jesus during night and remain in the darkness because he does not understand Jesus' message. And the Samaritan women meet Jesus at noon, where is the most light available during the day and understand he's a prophet. Hmm? It does not seem to matter. Even if there's our millions of reasons why she needs to go back to the well during the day, like she ran out of water sooner than expected. Uh, the jar in which she put her water broke, or she was too busy to come in the morning, early in the morning to draw water. It does not seem to matter. She is not where we expect her to be. She's not behaving according to the norm of her society. There, therefore, there must be something wrong with the Samaritan women. And usually, when someone looks for a justification, our Bible could be very helpful. So verse 17 and 18 says, Jesus said to her, you're right, in saying, I have no husband, for you have had five husbands, and the one you have right now is not your husband. And we read this, and once again we say, ha ha, knew it. She's a woman of little virtue. Even if King Solomon might have had 700 wives and 300 concubines, no respectable women would have had, had five different husbands and living with another she's not married with. Now, even if the second book of Kings, chapter 17, tells us that the Assyrian, after the Assyrian invasion, Samaria was colonized by five different foreign nation, people from foreign nation who worship five different God in, in, during Jesus' time. They were closer, the Samaritans were closer to the Jews without being, let's say, in essential agreement. Five past husband, one not quite married. It does not seem to matter. Even if in the ancient times, and still today, there are plenty of reason for someone to have multiple relationships during one's lifetime, like her husband's died, she had been abandoned, divorced, or, or being an unattached woman, forced her to live with someone to, who could protect and provide her. It does not seem to matter. She's a nasty woman without moral, she's a whore, she's a prostitute, and she needs to repent from her sin. And only one man, called Jesus, can save her. The Samaritan women Jesus met at the well most likely had the pass. 
like all of us have one. We all have moments in our lives we would prefer to forget or completely erase. And we can also assume that the Samaritan woman was not necessarily rich or powerful or highly educated as today's woman can be. She knew her status in her community. She had been told the rules of her society. She had been instructed not to talk or <laughs> not interact with Jesus' male, a Jewish male, sorry, Jewish males. Nevertheless, when the opportunity for an open conversation about the hot buttons topics that divide Jews and Samaritans from one another shows itself, she persisted. She disregards expectations and cultural norms in order to embark with Jesus on a journey of discovery. And when the disciple come back with something to eat, they cannot believe what they're seeing. They are dumbfounded that Jesus would speak to a Samaritan woman, and while they're still scratching their heads to understand what their master, to understand their master behavior, they don't notice that she's already gone. She has already left everything behind and she's sharing the new life she just has found. Nothing predisposed the Samaritan women to speak about faith or preaching the good news. And there were probably many reasons the leaders of the village could have invoked to ridicule or silence her. Nevertheless, she persisted and the Samaritan women became the first missionary in the Gospels. We often believe that one characteristic or story can define an individual. Sometimes we think that life would be simpler if everyone could be identified, labeled, organized, or put in a few predetermined boxes. We like to assume that all the ENTP of this world would think exactly in this way and all the ISTJ behave that way. This is where stereotypes come from. And we all know from experience there are limits. But in this story, on that day, Jesus seems to understand that the Samaritan woman is someone more than what people believed or expected. And for this reason, he sees her. He truly sees her. She exists for him. She had worth, value, and significance. A treatment different from what she was accustomed to. And today, as we are reading from this famous, famous passage, we're challenged to ask ourselves about who we do not see. Who are the, what, sorry, what are the defying factor, visible defying factor we will categorize someone who are interrupted, shush, or silence in our society or in our churches. And sadly enough, the list could be very long. Those who are racialized, disabled, or homeless. What about linguistic minorities, recovering addicts? or women who simply want to take their place, their rightful place, in a man's world. Our call is not to develop politically correct policies or, or wondering if we have the time or the means to include more people in our structures. 
our goal is to reach out to people beyond stereotypes and cliches. Our call is to connect and build bridges with individuals who are not necessarily meeting our expectation or corresponding to our desires. Our call is to help every human being not to become what we want them to be, but for them to achieve their full potential that God gave them. The Samaritan women we meet in the Gospel according to John is the spiritual matriarch of all the nasty, loud, persistent, and fearless women from across centuries in a world that would like nothing better than silencing her, she stands her ground. She crosses boundaries. She defies assumptions. And by doing so today, she gives hope to all the nameless people of this world because nevertheless, she persisted. Amen.